Okay, guys. So welcome back. I didn't hear the bell ringing, so I suppose that I will have to shout again for everyone to come in if the doors are open, but they are not. Okay. So no one can hear us <laughs> outside this room. Yeah, I'm sure they will start coming in. So just announcement that uh, at 5.30 p.m. will be the closing session. So yeah, it's the, 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 fl the time really flies by so fast. We are already talking about closing. I feel like we opened an hour ago. But yeah, nevertheless, so uh, 5.30 here will be the closing session and then all the uh, sponsors will be giving out the rewards they prepared for you. Uh, okay, so we have the pleasure of hosting uh, Antonis here for the third time <laughs> on, uh, uh, in the organization of HeapSpace. He spoke uh, previously on Vox Days. Uh, uh, he actually works for a food delivery service in Athens correct in Greece for sure and uh, it's called eFood uh, we recently had an expansion of those services here Vault came uh, Glovo who delivers everything we had our own platform called Donesi or bring it <laughs> Donesi is translate. also I think part of uh, Delivery Hero which is really uh, which has bought also eFood so part of the same company now. yeah G good to hear that yeah we are all connected <laughs> uh, so how is the uh, food delivery network in Greece working currently so I think Greeks order too much uh, <laughs> from outside. So I mean, uh, also we have a lot of coffee delivery. So mm -hmm. Greece is a very good market, I think, for online delivery. And how is your competition over there? I mean, uh, do you improve each other? I <laughs> think uh, eFood is one of the leaders. Mm -hmm. We have also Walt, which was mm -hmm. uh, introduced a few months ago. But yeah. uh, I think it's a lot smaller. I mean, I'm not on the business side to see the actual numbers. But uh, from what yeah. I understand from friends and family who are ordering from eFood, yeah. Yeah, you are the best. <laughs> no, okay. we, I mean, our marketing is the best <laughs> and hopefully our tech is also good yeah. enough. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure it will be. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for hosting me and uh, thank, thanks to all of you for being up so late after two days. I hope you had uh, enough of coffee and uh, you'll be happy to see the presentation. So in this uh, presentation, I'll uh, try to give some uh, pros and cons of using containers. So although I love containers and I use it every day, I'll try to see uh, and discuss with you if this is a good choice and which are the things that you would need to consider when switching to containers. Before we start, uh, a few things about me. I'm a Docker Captain, which is a program from the company Docker that's uh, similar to the Microsoft MVP, all the other programs that uh, get people from the community and uh, give them more resources in order to do presentations and that kind of stuff. I usually code in Python. I really love it, and I recently started also doing some development in Go. So I'll try to give examples from other languages too, but excuse me for uh, sticking with uh, my favorite language. As uh, we said before, I'm a senior software engineer at eFood. Uh, so I'm mostly on the developer side uh, at this point. But I'm also doing, uh, on the side, uh, a lot of uh, container training and consulting with my company called Sourceler with my partner in Paris in Athens. Uh, my, my general motto is uh, that I love to automate stuff. So whatever can be automated, I'd like to automate it. So I'm a bit crazy on, on, that, uh, on that end. And uh, I also like to, to share knowledge. So you might find me speaking often in meetups in Athens uh, often or in conferences like this one. Um, what we're going to talk about today, which is uh, the interesting stuff, so first of all, uh, we'll try to see the different deployment options that one has for deploying th uh, their applications in their company. Of course, containers will be one of them, but we'll also examine other ones and see all the different pros and cons and how do they operate, what are the, the costs, the benefits, etc. Then we'll see more specifically about uh, containers, what containers bring into the game, how do they change the game and why, uh, why or why not they are better or worse. We'll see some obstacles because every new technology and every technology adoption has some obstacles. So we'll try to uh, realistically see what challenges we will face when switching to containers. And after that, of course, we'll see all the nice things that containers excel. At the end, provided that the internet permits us, uh, there's a funny little game to see, that, uh, to see if we understood everything from the presentation. And of course, uh, we'll have some time from Q&A. So if you have some questions, feel free to ask them here or grab them later. Um, so let's start with a joke. So as every joke, a container walks into the bar. And OK, I'm not going to bother you with uh, stupid jokes about containers, but I really thought this was a nice intro. And let's see a situation which is a bit more realistic. So 
let's say that you walk uh, in the morning into the office and a, management, um, and a manager starts saying things, uh, con uh, container buzzwords, cloud and other fun words, and says, okay, you know, we need to do cloud native things or containers or cloud or whatever. And then you're like, why are you going to do this? And it's like, okay, you know, I went to a CXO uh, conference the, the other day, and they said that they had uh, 10x uh, the performance by moving to containers. So if we take the application, no change anything, put in containers, it's going to be 10 times better. So your task today is to move everything to containers. And how many of you have faced this or something similar? Is anyone in the room here? I see a few shy uh, hands raising. So this is something that uh, has been uh, greatly heard of. And uh, what I'm trying to do in this presentation is try to see all the re <coughs> realistic reasons for moving to containers. And of course, the obstacles and the other things that uh, are not. So this is a comic strip. It uh, circulates the internet. Hopefully, um, I'm allowed to put it here. But we'll see that later. <laughs> Um, so let's start by examining the different deployment targets and uh, how can one deploy their applications if they want to. So one uh, separation that I'd like to, to, to make uh, at the beginning is uh, on the infrastructure level. So let's say that the provider a company provides us with infrastructure. This could be either bare metal, so actual servers, or infrastructure as a service, as you call it, or the cloud, or whatever you might have heard of it. So something that is more managed, but still infrastructure, so still machines, still either virtual machines or physical machines. And uh, there's a top level, high level uh, level, which is the application level. And this includes platforms like uh, Heroku, so platforms as a service, where you don't have uh, full control over how your application is going to run. And the company that provides you this application level infrastructure is responsible for running it for you. The, the first one, as we call them the bare metal, can be uh, things like Hetzner or Tophost or other bare metal providers that you might have heard of. And the, usually in these uh, cases, the infrastructure is being managed by a human being. So there's a human connecting machines with each other or putting physical machines into racks. So when you want to deploy new servers into this uh, um, infrastructure, then you have to make a ticket, for example. Someone has to go into the data center and put a machine into a new rack. Usually, but not always, in these cases, there's no virtualization involved. So your application is not running in virtual machines or virtual servers. It's running on actual physical machines, bare metal servers. On the contrary, which was uh, the introduction of the cloud, they said, OK, you know, companies should start stopping uh, using this infrastructure and uh, relying on slow processes in order to deploy new machines and new physical servers. And uh, they proposed an alternative, which was the infrastructure as a service model. So you have companies like Google Cloud, AWS, Azure, DigitalOcean, Scaleway, or whatever you want to call it. So there are many different companies providing infrastructure on that level that, in this case, the infrastructure can be automated. So you go and click a button, or you make an API call, and something gets done and returns immediately, or semi-immediately, in real time. So in this case, the infrastructure can be automated, because you can have programs uh, orchestrating the whole infrastructure provisioning for you. And uh, usually, there is virtualization involved. So in these cases, when you want to deploy a new server, this server is usually a virtual machine that's running somewhere in a cloud of this company. I'm saying usually because, for example, there are companies like Scaleway that are providing bare metal servers, but with the infrastructure of the service model. So, for example, they have bare metal servers running your application, but might have uh, virtualization for connecting those servers together. So the network, for example, is virtualized. All these uh, things provide different uh, flexibility and different, um, let's say, guarantees on the infrastructure. So for example, bare metal servers are usually more cheap. But on the contrary, bare metal servers uh, do not provide as much guarantees about reliability and uptime as uh, virtual machines. So for example, if your actual physical host running your bare metal server dies, then there are no good solutions about moving this machine to another one. There is many manual steps that need to be uh, made in order to do this. On the infrastructure as a service uh, offering, you might have uh, even uh, sometimes you can have uh, machine restarts without the application noticing 
the actual restart. So you, your VM might be hot moved to another server without you realizing this change. So everything happens on a different level. So actual hardware failures do not mean 100% of the times failures in your application and your servers. Of course, bare metal servers are harder for you to operate and give you some, some good options. And cloud gives you another, some other options with other, for example, costs or other uh, things to consider. So in this uh, paradigm, then we go to application level, which is something that you've heard maybe more times recently, and especially in the conference. You have a more classic platforms as a service. So for example, you have things like Heroku, Google App Engine, and uh, that kind of stuff where you deploy your application, you just send your code, and then your code gets packaged or whatever, and you don't know what actually happens. There's a magic step there, and it starts running, so you don't have absolute control over what you are going to do. And usually, this is using pre-baked environments. So you cannot choose all the different libraries you are going to put in your application, or you are not going to, to say, OK, you know, I want to run this application alongside the worker, because platform as a service clearly defines how is this being made. The evolution of a platform as a service is what we try to call serverless. But uh, wait for it, because there's a catch. There are servers involved in serverless. I don't know who knew that. That are the, there are ser OK, many of you. That's good. So in serverless, uh, the, the shifting paradigm says that you don't care about your service. So this is the actual thing. You don't care about if you need like one, two, three, or 1,000 servers for running your application, while in the platform as a service, you had control over the different instances running. Also, a big change is that if your application is not running, excuse me, if your application is not in use, it's not running, meaning that you don't pay for your application when it's not uh, up and running, and you pay a lot more if your application runs a lot in parallel. So all these different uh, deployment uh, levels gives us different um, perspectives on how we are going to manage our infrastructure and the infrastructure that application runs. But where do containers fit to the whole picture? And what are actually containers? So let's go a step back and uh, see what is a container and how a container can actually fit in the into the whole picture of the different infrastructure uh, types that we saw before. So the first thing is that a container is actually a simple process. So a container is not a virtual machine, it's not a different physical server, it's just a process running inside a machine. So there's no actual difference between me running Python myfile.py and running an application and running this application inside the container. All the, uh, the changes are in, the, in, in two very important tools that we are using in order to make our application think that is virtualized. So we take this process, this uh, application running, and then we use two tools. The first one is namespaces. Anyone heard of namespaces before? A few of you. So namespaces allow us, it's a kernel feature actually, and allows us to wrap the application around a virtual, a virtual world. So the application thinks that it's in, a, it's in a different world when running inside namespaces. So for example, we have the network namespace. This means that I have my own virtual Ethernet, my own virtual network card, and I can bind to any port of it I want as a container, as an application, and this does not have anything to do with the application or the container running next to me. So I have my own world with my network, and I have my own virtual Ethernet card, and this is the network namespace. Another namespace is the file system namespace. So in the file system namespace, I can run a completely different Linux distribution from the container running next to me. So let's say that we have a Python application running on Ubuntu, which is a Linux uh, distribution with Python version 3.7, and an application running next to it with, uh, for example, Alpine, which is another Linux distribution, and Node version, whatever is the latest one, because I don't write Node and I don't know. So these two applications can have their own different file system, their, their different root, their different binaries and everything, and they don't have to mix this uh, together. So they are completely isolated. So that's the first kernel tool that we use. So you can have different applications with different requirements running one uh, side by side with another. The next one is called C groups or control groups. And this tool allows us to actually limit the resources that the application uses. So on once, let's say that we have a big machine, okay? So let's say that we have a machine with, uh, I don't know, 64 gigabytes of uh, memory and uh, 16 uh, cores of CPU. We don't want one 
malbehaving uh, mal application to take the whole resources of the machine. We want to have its application running its in, own, its in, in its own contained environment. So we're using C groups, and for example, the CPU C group that says that even though we have um, 16 cores in this machine, this application is going to use only one of the cores. So using the C group of CPU, we can make sure that one application will not take the CPU of the machine uh, alone. Also, the memory C group, for example, with another one, we can use it and say, you know, you, can take, you cannot take all the RAM of the machine. So, for example, if the application has a memory leak, it will start growing in memory up to a point, up to the limit that we have imposed with C groups. So, as you might start to understand, not depending if we use bare metal servers, infrastructure as a service, containers, or whatever, it all comes down to actually managing CPU and RAM. So all these different tools and all these different uh, infrastructures and infrastructure uh, services are actually a way for us to get some CPU and some RAM in some form and give it to our applications to run. So in the first scenario, for example, we have uh, the bare metal infrastructure on the bottom, which is in blue. Then we have a supervisor. Then we have three different virtual machines running one for each one application. So this is the infrastructure as a service model that we saw before. So in this model, we have three different kernels running and th three different applications. So we have to virtualize everything for each and one of these VMs. Containers, the only thing that they change if we just use containers on these virtual machines in the same infrastructure is actually Instead of having three different uh, versions of the kernel, having just one, and setting all those resources with the applications, and running on the side of them Docker or another uh, container runtime, like uh, container D or whatever you want to use. And this runtime is going to manage all the different applications and using namespaces, C groups, and all the other tools that containers use, make sure that these applications are constrained within the boundaries. So the th same thing that we can use VMs to, to have is uh, the same thing that we can also do with containers with different semantics. Of course, when containers started, we had another, let's say, hype, which said, OK, you know, we, we're going to run bare metal containers. And bare metal containers were nothing more than removing the supervisor, so not running everything inside VMs. So Let's have uh, having a bare metal server, having a VM inside it, and then inside the VM run containers, but removing the virtual, ma the virtual machine altogether and running the containers on the bare metal server. But this has other problems that VMs try to solve. So VMs try to solve uh, cutting big servers into smaller uh, pieces and managing them and moving them easily. And then uh, you throw this away for having containers run on bare metal and have a small improvement in CPU and memory. So I wouldn't say that bare metal containers is something that really kicked off. But it was something that, oh, you know, if we have containers, we can run them on bare metal, and we can have bare metal speed. That's not quite true, because, for example, we have para-virtualized drivers, which run on virtual machines, and allow applications running inside those machines to actually get directed to the, to the actual CPU and memory. So the speed reduction is very, very small for moving to bare metal. Another really important thing uh, that containers introduced into play, apart from the management of the CPU and the RAM, which was done in the way that we saw before, was a packaging format. And uh, I would say that this is one of the most important things that Docker and containers introduced, because the packaging of format is one of the things that we use currently and we see being adopted a lot. And by packaging format, I mean that we can now package our application into something we, which we call Docker images, for example, and send that something, that uh, a unit of deployment, to our operations team to run it. So let's say that on, uh, on previous, uh, before containers, we had, for example, Java and other applications like Java, where you said, OK, this is my code, this is my application. And then the application was packaged using uh, Java tools into jar or war files. And then those war files or jar files were sent to the operations team and were deployed to the actual production cluster. So in this case, we had the Java virtual machine, which was something uh, standing below the application that knew how to interpret the code, the, the bytecode of Java, and run actual instructions to the machine. And this gave you some guarantees that the same instructions running on production machine will be the same that running on the developer machine, and the application will behave in the exact same way. 
The only thing that uh, we couldn't uh, make sure in such a case was that if the application required some system libraries that could not be packaged inside a jar file, then those packages uh, should be communicated between the developers and the operations. And say, okay, you know, I, I need this new um, SSL library version, and uh, you must install it on the production machine. And then the operations had to go to the production machine and install this, um, this uh, new um, version of the library. So in another sense, you can think of Docker files and all these packets being format, because Docker files can also include the system libraries and everything. You can think of it as the API, the communication layer between two different teams. So one team can be responsible for running Docker images. It doesn't care if uh, these images are Java, Go, Python, Node, or whatever, as long as they, have, as they, they are packaged as Docker files and Docker images. And the developers on the other side can use those Docker images and produce them in order to deploy their service into production. So the packaging format of containers and Docker images specifically, I believe it's very important because it was the thing that was easy to communicate all those dependencies between two different teams. Let's see now that uh, we talked about containers, how do they come into play and how we can use them in the infrastructure level or the application level. So first of all, on the infrastructure level, you can deploy containers using a container con orchestration. So let's say that you have a bunch of machines in your production cluster. Let's say that you have nine of them. And this actually is a combined CPU and RAM as the resources. So you stop seeing each and every one of those machines as a single machine, but you watch them as a whole cluster. So this cluster, you can use a software called an orchestrator, which can be either Docker Swarm or Kubernetes or Mesos or whatever you want to use for your production cluster. And then instead of go and manage one application on each and every one of those machines, you just say to the orchestrator, I want to run this application, and the orchestrator goes on and runs it. So the orchestrator is the one that's watching over your cluster at all times and goes and makes sure that everything happens uh, as you want. Also, you can go a step further and create what we call a containers as a service platform. So those platforms try to imitate what was platforms as a service in uh, like the previous uh, examples, and try to give platforms as a service inside this company. So containers as a service could be platforms like, for example, Docker Enterprise, or OpenShift from Red Hat, or whatever enterprise Kubernetes offering you want to use. And all those uh, platforms, actually try to abstract all those different uh, bits and pieces that one should use in order to use an orchestrator and give you a higher level of abstraction. On the, other, uh, on the other end, on the application level side, then you have your application quite possibly running containers already. So if uh, you don't know how your application runs, it probably runs in containers. For example, Heroku, which was uh, happening long before Docker introduced containers to the, to the world, like us, uh, was running containers in production. So when you deploy an application in Heroku, which is a platform as a service offering, then your application runs in production. Google runs a lot of their software in containers. So uh, believe it or not, much of the code that uh, you use for C groups is written by Google like 10 or 15 years ago. So it's something as a technology that existed long before Docker and containers, but uh, Docker was the one that made containers available to developers with an easy CLI and an easy developer experience. It's not something that Docker created, actually. Also, uh, when you use application-level uh, infrastructure, like a serverless or a platforms as a service, now you most probably can use Docker images as a deployment unit. This means that you can build your Docker image with everything you want to package. And instead of running on a pre-baked environment, you can actually create your own environment to run it. So, Knowing how to create Docker images is really important uh, if you want to use uh, one of those platforms and uh, be able to customize it to your needs. Now, when you deploy containers in any of those cases, it doesn't mean that it solves all your problems. It's not, it doesn't mean that your application is going to be faster or more resilient or anything. Actually, containers do not solve your problems, and this is really important to, to take a note. So containers are actually a tool that helps you but not a tool that we are going to say, OK, you know, enable containers. Everything is going fine now. Actually, Kelsey Hightower, which is a developer advocate for Google and one of the most respected advocates in the space for containers, said that, you know, you cannot just take, uh, for example, a MySQL database 
put it in containers, make it distributed, and then uh, you have something like RDS, which is a distributed database uh, with MySQL semantics from a a AWS. So it's not easy to create a managed service like a a a RDS, which has resiliency, which is distributed, and which you can actually uh, make sure, uh, not make sure, but be sure that your data is always going to be safe. It's not easy like that. You need a necessary team to manage your infrastructure. You need people who know about database to make this database distributed. It's not like because you're using containers or orchestrators or whatever that your application is going to be more resilient and more secure. What actually containers do is that they transform your problems. So if you remember from math or from school, when you had a very difficult problem, you use some tools, some theorems, in order to transform a problem into other, more simpler ones, then solve those, those simpler ones, and then have a solution for the initial problem. That you, you can think containers of a, as of a tool that can do the same thing about your infrastructure. If you are having some very hard problems that you cannot use with your current tools, you can transform your problems and introduce new ones, but those new ones will hopefully be easier to solve, and that's why you're going to solve your problems for your infrastructure. It's not like a magic button that you can press and everything is going to be solved. So moving to containers introduces some problems that probably you didn't have before. So for example, when you start running applications in containers, you don't know where your applications are running. As we said before, in containers, you usually take a cluster, so a bunch of machines, and then you say to the orchestrator, to the software managing that cluster, start running my application two, three, five times, and that application and the other one. So instead of knowing that you know machine one and two running my web server, machine three runs my database, machine five to seven runs my, I don't know, my workers, and then go into each on, in one of those machines and troubleshoot and see what's going uh, badly, you can't do it anymore, and now you need other tools in order to understand what's happening in your infrastructure. So containers introduce, uh, as we said, new problems because you don't know what's running. The second uh, big problem that you introduce with containers is that you need a way to network all those containers. So let's say that your container running somewhere in the cluster needs to talk to the database running somewhere else. This container cannot have a static IP, for example, for your database machine as you used to have before, because in this way, this uh, container might change, might stop and start a new one, and this will get a new IP, and thus the old IP will be invalid. So you need a way to constantly network those containers in a consistent way. This is being done usually with overlay networks, so with networks which work on the software level on top of the actual networking that happens between your virtual machines or your hardware. And these networks have uh, ways and semantics in order to consistently talk between containers. But this is another uh, complex software that you put in your stack and you, know you have to know how to manage it. Of course, I'm talking about stateful applications, and stateful applications is a completely different beast to, to tame when you're talking about containers. So stateful applications introduce many different problems, like, for example, you need to synchronize where your, application, where your container is going to spawn and make sure that the data is moved to the same container, because your database is nothing without the actual data backing it. Also, uh, those, are, those containers cannot scale and, and uh, scale out and in without a problem, because you cannot have like three MySQL databases and that's it. You need to coordinate between them. You need to assign roles, for example, masters and uh, followers and all that kind of stuff. Of course, since you don't know what's happening in there, you need new monitoring solutions. So you need solutions to make sure that you understand what's happening in your cluster. You understand which applications are malfunctioning, which are taking more CPU and RAM than expected. Which applications are talking to which other applications inside the cluster, and if some connection has a problem and is being delayed, for example. This might not be a problem with your application. This might be even a problem with the overlay networks. So you need tools and solutions to make sure that you understand what's happening there. And last, but definitely not least, if you have applications that are super, uh, that have super strict security uh, precautions, then you might not want to run those applications inside the containers because you want to separate them in different VMs. Of course, container isolation is very good, but it's not as good as VMs. 
in the same way that VMs are not as good uh, isolation as having completely different physical hardware running the applications. So if you are running two applications side by side and one does not have very good security because it's like uh, your marketing uh, website that you deployed recently to have a new campaign and the other one has uh, healthcare data for your, uh, for your people there and an attacker manages to get to gain root access control, for example, in the application that is the marketing website, then this attacker might have also access to the other, to the other containers running in the same host. So it's really important to understand that you have to separate your applications and if you have super secure applications that you don't want by any means to be tasked from outside um, visitors, you have either to separate your clusters into groups, for example, secure applications, marketing applications, whatever, or you have to run those applications in completely different VMs. So it's really important to, to have this in mind when moving to containers. But enough with all the bad things. Let's, uh, cheer, let's cheer up a bit and uh, see all the, the good things that uh, containers uh, bring into the game and why you might want to, to move into containers. So first of all, your current problems might be even harder to solve than, contain, uh, than the problems introduced by containers. So let's say that uh, the business needs are changing or the application is changing and then your current solutions are not good enough and re-architecting your solutions for the, new, um, for the new requirements is not as easy as you thought. And then in this case, you might want to consider containers as an alternative because it's going to solve you some of the problems, introduce some new ones, but those new ones are not as hard as the current ones, so you're fine with it. Also, the architecture, the architecture of the application might change a lot. Like, for example, you go and you split your application to multiple services. So instead of having like two or three or five applications, now you have 40. And 40 applications are not easy to manage in a one-by-one uh, one basis on VMs and you want to try a new solution. Or you might want to have a lot of helper services running into containers. So all the new services go there, but the old infrastructure continues working as is. So it's not like you have to completely transform your infrastructure into containers. You can just choose and pick your day, the application that makes sense for you. Another problem that we see often with uh, customers that we go for training or consulting is that they have very slow pipelines and uh, those pipelines are really hard to change because they have many or either manual steps or things that, uh, for example, VMs are slow to build or they don't have these communication layers between uh, developers and operations and they need a way to go faster and give more responsibility to the actual developers so they can package the applications in a better way then ma this might be a good uh, idea for moving into containers. And of course, the most important uh, thing for, con for developers is that you want to ride the hype. Containers is something new. You want to change it. You want to play with it. I mean, all of us, by the end of the day, want to play with new things. We, we want to tinker. That's why we are engineers and we want to, to play with things. So you might want to try containers for something new. So that's completely fair. And but given that you consider the implications, then you can move the containers just for play and just for fun. Some of the things that containers really excel is that, um, first of all, it's really easy to make your deployment pipeline faster. So it's faster to build Docker images, it's faster to transfer those images to a production cluster, and it's faster to roll forward or backward to a different uh, version of your application. Also, it's easy because you can easily uh, describe your high-level architecture as code. So it's really handy because uh, there are many tools and uh, because there are many tools in the stack that are software defined, like the networks and that kind of stuff. So it's easy to define all those tools on, the, uh, on your code and put this inside the repository. It's really important to have all these definitions inside the, the GitHub, for example, or the uh, source code repository that you have uh, for your code because then you can track all those changes and the evol evolution of your application. Also, by using containers, you have a, a better bridge between developers and operations, and you give more power to the developers. But beware, because with great power comes great responsibility. So by giving a lot of power to developers, you allow them to, to make mistakes, and you have to, to have a pipeline that takes care of it. And uh, you have, for example, good code review. You have some uh, steps that make sure that the application is not crossing, and you have tests, CI, CD, and that kind of stuff. 
Also, another side effect is that uh, because containers are very cheap and easy to run on your local machine, you can easily replicate this environment between your development, your test or CI, and your production infrastructure. So the same container runs on your developer machine while you're coding and developing your application. The same one goes and tests your applications on your CI, and the same one can be deployed to, to production, which is a very nice plus when using containers. So some of the, the, the questions that you should ask yourself when uh, you want to, to make an infrastructure switch, and this is one of uh, the processes that we work with customers when they want to do something completely different, is that you have to consider the cost of people for managing all those infrastructures and uh, the cost of managed services. For example, let's say that uh, you are currently on Heroku, which is more expensive than buying virtual machines, for example, and you say, okay, do I want to uh, make the investment and pay more the people and less the actual platform because my infrastructure changes? Do I have the people? Do I have the skill set? So it's not like, okay, you know, AWS is cheaper than Heroku, so I'll go to AWS. AWS has a completely different guarantee for you. It says, okay, the machine is going to run. If your application runs, no one cares. If your application wants to scale, then you have to scale the, the machines. You have to, to, to plan for that. Also, another uh, very good factor in those cases is uh, the infrastructure variance. So let's say that you have an application like a food delivery service, for example, that's uh, usually very heavy in the morning where people are ordering coffee and in the noon and evening when people order food. But it's not as, uh, as intensive in the night, for example, because usually people sleep in the night. So in that case, you want to make sure that your, uh, your infrastructure can scale out and scale in dynamically uh, during the day. Or you might have uh, something like an online shop, which is really intensive during Christmas because people like to buy gifts during Christmas, but it's not so intensive during summer. So you have to make sure that all these different cases are handled by your infrastructure. And also, product stage is really important, and you're planning for the next years. So if you're a small company building an MVP and you want to have it yesterday, then uh, maybe it's not a good idea to invest in infrastructure because you want to invest in the code and actually build the product that the end users that your, your customers are going to use. But if you're a company which is more stable and you want to plan for the next, I don't know, three to five years, maybe you want to pre-buy uh, some VMs or you want to scale your infrastructure or invest in the team that's going to manage the infrastructure because in five years' time, then this investment is going to pay off. So it's not like uh, an easy choice. It's not like there's always a solution. It's like either VMs or containers or bare metal or infrastructure as a service or pass or serverless. Every different application is, uh, has its own needs and you need to consider all those uh, different options and make sure that the, the one you choose is the best for, your, for you. And the best for you is the infrastructure that's actually best for your people because the people in the company are the ones that are most affected by the infrastructure. It's not like, you know, I want yesterday a cluster and you have to make it because you are an ops. No, it's not that easy. And you also have to consider all your business needs because the people that run the company, the actual uh, developers and the operations, and your end users and customers are the ones that are most important for your business. And these are the ones that have the final say on your infrastructure. Now, before... Uh, we, uh, we finish the session, let's play a little game and see if we understood everything that was in the presentation and hopefully we'll have some um, time for uh, questions. So go to kahoot.it and then use this code and hopefully you're going to be presented with a, a screen for, uh, your, uh, <coughs> for the game to play. And uh, the winner gets those three pins because uh, I thought of the game today and it was the only thing that I had that wasn't part of the conference. So I'm going to switch. Cool. Okay, we have some people coming in. So you go to kahoot.it with your phone. Hopefully the internet is good enough and you use this code to play. And uh, the one with the faster internet will win. <laughs> okay, I'll give you 20 more seconds and then uh, we'll start. Oh, too many people. I was afraid that I, I was going to be alone in this game, but thank you for participating. <laughs> okay, 10.
Okay, let's start. So all the questions are true, false, and the question is, you moved containers when? So you have to uh, see what it says here and answer it true or false. Your boss comes after attending a CXO conference and tells you to move everything to Kubernetes. You go to Kubernetes or not? Okay, <laughs> answers coming in. Oh, false, okay. Okay, Nemanja is the faster one. If, uh, sorry if I'm pronouncing it uh, wrong. You've heard of a great tool that will solve one of your minor problems. You go to containers or not? Answers coming in. Okay, Nemanja, still on the top. <laughs> Jay is second, but he's very close, or she's very close. Your current architecture is keeping you from shipping new features quickly. Do you go to containers or not? Forty-four answers. Oh, okay, so that was true. Let's go to the next one. Oh, Jay was faster now. <laughs> true or false, your customers demand for your product solution to be cloud native. You go to containers or not? You're pretty fast. <laughs> Maybe you're most from Belgrade and you have 4G, that's why. Oh, okay, so that was not, maybe that was a puzzle question. But the correct one was false. You don't listen to your customers always. Oh, Salix, you have a new first. And the last question, your microservices are small enough, making cost ineffective to boot whole VMs for them. You move the containers or not? Okay, that was correct, so you moved the container. So what was trying to, oh, okay, let's see who's the winner, sorry. Bla Blago, Blago, sorry. Bla You're, it's you? Congratulations. Okay, so find me afterwards to give you the pins. Um, so the, the idea of uh, the whole game was to uh, tell you that it's not uh, like random factors that make you choose a different infrastructure, it's actual things that matter to you in your day-to-day -day basis that do it. So thanks a lot. I, I'm Antonis. You can find me on Twitter or you can tweet using the hashtag of the conference. And I would be really happy to have a few questions. We have three and a half minutes. That's great. And uh, also, of course, if we don't have time, I'll be happy to talk uh, with you afterwards. So any questions? I don't see. No questions? One question. Uh, so the question is, should we move to containers? And I think the answer is, I don't know. Maybe you know better than me, <laughs> because it's your specific use case. S sorry if it's called, it wasn't the answer you were <laughs> hoping for. Another one? No questions. But you were pretty good with the game, so maybe you understood everything, that's why you have no questions. Anyway, thanks a lot, guys.